Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where we meet every Tuesday to talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft. In this episode, I talk to author Rachel Henderson. We talk about how she practices on the astral plane, why witchcraft is serious business, and at the end, I tell you how to win an autographed copy of her book, The Scent of Lemon and Rosemary, over on Instagram. But first, here's a word from this week's sponsor, Full of Intention. Are you looking for quality handmade magical items for your practice? Perhaps a dressed spell or altar candle, a crystal bracelet, or a magical oil to aid in your workings. Full of Intention is a purveyor of high quality handmade goods made by and for witches. Bring luck, love, and abundance into your life with a little help from Full of Intention. Shop the online boutique at www.fullofintention.com. Listeners can use promo code WITCH20 to save 20% on your first order. In addition to candles, oils, and crystal jewelry, the shop also features stunning macrame decor for your home and altar, tea blends, and more, all made with intention. For additional information, online tutorial, and magical content, visit the Full of Intention shop, as well as our TikTok and YouTube channels. Links will be in the show notes. Now let's get to the stories. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Would you please introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Rachel Henderson. I am an author and a witch. I uh, am the author of Sew Witchy, uh, Tools, Techniques, and Projects for Sewing Magic, as well as The Scent of Lemon and Rosemary, Working Domestic Magic with Hestia. I kind of describe myself as a witch crafter. I like to bring magic into every aspect of my daily life, but especially in my crafting and sewing, and that's what I try to talk to people about, uh, how to make their life more magical. I'm on Instagram. That's the best way to find me. Uh, my handle on there is idiorhythmic, which is a word that means living by one's life's own, living a life by one's own patterns. Uh, and I am on Facebook as well, uh, same name, Idiorhythmic, and yeah, that's, that's where you can f most easily find me online. Cool. What made you write? Oh, um, I've wanted to be an author my entire life. Like, when I was little, even before I could write, I would scribble things on pieces of paper and pretend I was, like, a journalist or something. I have been a lifelong reader and have just always really enjoyed the written word and kind of, while well, I've always wanted to be a writer, kind of fell into this uh, being published kind of an accident? Kind of not. <laughs> I wrote my first book, So Witchy, and I was planning on, and it was just a collection of basically my, the kind of book of shadows I put together of uh, things I did when I was sewing. And I had originally thought, well, I'll just self-publish it because I thought sewing magic was a really niche market and, and topic and I didn't think anybody was really going to be I figured like you know a dozen people would what? care uh I did and so I was going to self-publish and um someone said well why don't you just try to get it published why don't you just yeah, query shop it some around. yeah just query some some publisher see you know and I thought well okay I could give it like six months and then you know if nobody bites then I'll just self-publish it and um so I went to my bookshelf and I'm like, okay, who do I have on my, you know, where are the publishers of magic books? And I made a short list and I queried Llewellyn and that was, they got back to me and said, yep, no, we want to publish this book. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and you already had it written at that point. I had it mostly written. I, I had it about 50% done and uh, finished the other 50% after I signed the contract. And it was a journey. I ended up 
halfway through it losing my house and me and my family were homeless for about six weeks. In the midst of that, I'm taking pictures and writing stuff and trying to get the edits finished so I could get them turned in. And then the book came out November of 2019 and I had a whole bunch of like book signings and stuff all lined up and then oh. COVID hit. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Yeah, so it was an exciting time. <laughs> Man, that's a lot. It's it's pretty funny. Um, I am, I just turned in the edits for my third book, and every single book I've written so far, something has happened. The second book was written during the early, the first six months of the uh, pandemic. And then this third book, I had a move kind of across the country in the middle of it so oh, geez yeah so now I'm just I I joke with my husband I said I if I get started on a fourth book uh we're living in um <laughs> Wyoming now so I'm like oh my goodness then like the, the Yellowstone super <laughs> volcano is gonna explode and I'll don't, just be standing there going don't. but I have a deadline <laughs> don't curse us <laughs> I know don't jinx us. <laughs> yeah, he's like, if it explodes, we're going to have other other bigger problems. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'll have a deadline. <laughs> what does it mean to you when you call yourself a witch? For me, it's really simple. I use magic in my life. I view it slightly as a, not political, but as a extension of the part of my personality that often is not really acceptable in, I guess, modern society where we're not expected to, there, there's this uneasy acceptance of major belief systems where, okay, we believe in, you can pray, you can have faith, but anything beyond that, then they start looking at you like, oh, you're into that woo-woo stuff. And having grown up as kind of the weird kid and not really fitting in anywhere, being able to call myself a witch gives me uh, just a better sense of who I am, that there is a part of me that I accept and that I, sure, woo-woo, if that's how you want to call it, but I believe that there's more to it than just what we see and feel and hear and can touch. And that's just me accepting that part of myself in the same way as I give myself the labels of being a writer or a woman or a mother, uh, a wife, that sort of thing. I think it's really weird that it seems like society as a whole has moved away from if you, you can have some spirituality but if you have too much you're crazy that's really strange to me that we're supposed to completely block out that part of ourselves yeah and that's one of the things that i have really worked very hard on is um getting away from this kind of like compartmentalization of our lives where you know you give yourself labels and everything has to fit into that one label and they don't bleed into that it has to be a Venn diagram where nothing is actually overlapping and I really want try very hard in my life to be like uh, I am and also not I'm a mother and a witch I am a I am bisexual and have faith in that there's more to the world than what we can experience having all that and also rather than this or that well being a weird kid myself <laughs> i relate <laughs> that said do you have any family history with witches or witchcraft or do you have any stories or things that you remember from childhood where you think nobody in my family called themselves a witch unless they did call themselves witches in which case tell me those stories but <laughs> I don't get too many of those. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. I was actually raised Baptist by my grandmother. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's there's a lot of us ex Baptists who yeah. just were like, eh, witchcraft. Yeah. No, my family, like my parents, were not are not religious. We ended up the kids ended up going to church with uh, my grandparents because then my parents got Sunday mornings off. But I was very much, you know, I did 
youth group. I taught bi vacation Bible school. I did church camp. I was very much involved in that. I have heard stories from my dad's side of the family, from my uncle about how there is perhaps a history of seers, people who have had visions and the like, and he has had some of that. But no, our family was either, you know, there was the side that was very much non-religious and then the side that was very much Baptist religious. And I remember when I was growing up that I was very much into magic, although it was much more related to like the kind of magic you find in fantasy novels because I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, where the library was had a very uh, had a fabulous science fiction and fantasy section because one of the librarians there was really into that and like had submitted scripts for like Star Trek the Next Generation and the like, but anything kind of occulty or witchy was not they didn't have any of that. So my experience of magic and witchcraft came from fantasy novels and when I would talk about that being, you know, believing in magic or I'm a witch or uh you know, well if God created the world in seven days. How is that not magic? And how is there, you know, how does that not say that there's magic in the world? I would get various responses that were all negative, especially from the church side of the family where they were very much, you know, the Bi you know what the Bible says about witches. And I'd be like, okay, I guess I should just kind of keep this to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Can you introduce us to your practice? Like, do you have any daily or consistent rituals that you do? Yeah, I uh, my practice is very much comes from inside, motivated by how do I feel today. My one consistent practice lately has been doing a single tarot draw in the morning just to see like what my day is going to be like or what kind of messages that are trying to get to me. But a lot of my practice tends to be, I'm not really big on ritual or big rituals. Part of that is just because I have kids and I just don't have the time to to do a big to-do. It's a lot of candle lighting, which I use as a way to kind of focus and bring myself, ground myself and bring myself uh, mindfully into my present just to take a moment, check in with myself, check in with the universe. I like, I'm a Aries, so fire is a big part of my my magic casting. So lighting candles, lighting incense, that, that flick of the match just kind of brings my brain back to there's magic. And I use a lot of um, burning for when I'm casting spells. Uh, so every day lighting a candle, talking to Hestia, Working with burning incense, if I'm casting a spell, it tends to be in the form of uh, gathering herbs together uh, with intention and grinding them up and then burning them on a charcoal burner. And then I do a lot of, I call it mind magic. It's just basically toolless magic, like putting protection around my house is just envisioning the white light boundary around my house, doing a lot of just sending out my intentions into the universe via meditation, that sort of thing. I, it feels like our practices are very similar, except <laughs> that I don't really interact with deity a lot, but <laughs> that sounds very similar to how I do it. It must be a Baptist thing. <laughs> Maybe. I should I, I should do huh. we should do some sort of um survey oh. to say were you are you a former Baptist turned witch? What's your practice look like? <laughs> That's actually inner I kinda wanna do that. <laughs> <laughs> I will totally participate in that survey. Now I know you've already gone into this a little bit when you introduced yourself, but how has witchcraft changed your life? Honestly, being able to embrace and practice openly has given me a lot more confidence and a lot more just feeling at home in myself. When you hide a part of yourself from the rest of the world, it creates a lot of space for self-doubt, for dissatisfaction, for unhappiness. And having finally come out and said, you know, and, and 
it's a little bit similar, but not exactly similar. It's um, it's kind of much more low stakes uh, when I came out as bisexual. Being able to just say, yeah, no, this is a part of me, and this is what I do, and this is what I believe. And uh, by being able to state that out loud, that helped uh, diminish some of that self-doubt and that, well, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, smart people are skeptical and don't believe in this stuff. And if I believe in it, maybe I'm not that smart. Um, so it's just given me a lot of more self-confidence, a lot more being at ease with myself as a person. Good. Because <laughs> that statement made me mad a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I got issues with people thinking I'm dumb. <laughs> I, That's a I, new thing. Yeah. <laughs> What would you say is your biggest motivator in your practice? My biggest motivator is uh, really trying to live my life as fully and completely as I can. Um, again, I this idea of this um, that every part of our life has to fit into a little box and it's all separate. So we have like our work life and our home life and our uh, religious life and our game life or whatever, um, I work very hard to integrate all that and to not have, and to have a, a full, complete life. So I, you know, when I'm cooking, I'm not just cooking, I'm being mindful of, okay, here are the ingredients. What do I want to foster at my dinner table with my family when I'm uh, sewing? I want to bring in those, uh, when I'm sewing for um, stuff to sell, I want to bring in that, those abundance and money energies so that I can uh, make money to pay bills so that um, we have food on the table. It's, it's very much just, that's my goal, is to live a life that's a little bit closer to what we our ancestors had where you know everything was all together it wasn't compartmentalized there wasn't uh these boundaries it was much more um i feel like a fully realized life i kind of i like that idea but for me because I don't feel like I belong in society. I wear a lot of masks in my <laughs> costume, so <laughs> the when I, the the Kim who leaves the house, I don't feel is the same person as, as the one who's talking to you right now. <laughs> and uh, for a lot of people, that kind of um, masking is absolutely uh, imperative and uh, is not only necessary to. Um, maneuver in society but also uh sometimes it's a safety issue so i do not at all uh think any less of people who have to do that because for so many years i had to as well and that's kind of for my second book one of the themes of that is look home is supposed to be a safe place and for a lot of people it isn't but let's make home a safe place where you don't have to put up those masks you you can at least have one place where you can be fully yourself where you don't have to uh live up to society's expectations especially if those expectations are not anything that you're interested in <laughs> <laughs> i was so just talking about that this morning with my husband yeah, it's... Um, I was like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life because I don't fit uh, traditional. It's, well, not even traditional. I don't fit current U.S. society standards. It's of, of really what you hard. It is really, really hard. Like, right now, I am finally free enough that uh, my family and I were trying to live this magical, creative, non-traditional life. And, man, it's hard. The self doubt that creeps in, the <laughs> yeah. uh, you know when you're looking at how much or how yeah, little money I, you have. Are we in crazy? Your... <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> when you're like, oh, look at my bank balance. Eesh. And you're looking at all the bills oh piling gosh. up and everything. But um, it's it's an experiment. And uh, I figure that, you know, I at least owe it to my younger self to at least give it a try. Um, Speaking of your self-doubt, how do you deal with it? So... Here, here we go. I have, I've, I've lived with depression all my life, uh, and for the majority of my life, it was undiagnosed, um, and anxiety and the like. And I have uh, issues with like intrusive thoughts, so self doubt. I call it my jerk brain that will always pipe up and say, "Yep, uh, just horrible things. things to you." Yeah, horrible <laughs> things, like uh, just the sort of things that if I ever heard anybody say those things to my friends or family, I would be, you know, getting a little violent. Exactly. There would be uh, a fist fight. <laughs> yeah. But one thing that I did is I turned to magic for that. And what I did is I created a servitor. It looked like a bird, looked like a raven. I called it Nevermore. And its sole job was to whenever uh, those intrusive jerk brain thoughts popped up, that it would swoop in and eat them. And I had that servitor for several years, and it really helped. Um, and in fact, I've been in therapy too, because you know I believe in medication and therapy and, uh, and also magic. And my therapist was like, oh, well, this is just, uh, I can't remember what the term was, but there's a certain um, therapy where it's kind of, you distract your brain from when these... Uh, intrusive thoughts pop up and she's like oh it's just like that you're just doing it as as a magical spin on it um and oh yeah because you can't remove thoughts you have to replace thoughts right and by the way for people who don't know what a servitor is i just had oh. to google it a oh person sorry who serves or attends on a social superior <laughs> it is um it's a or what do you how do you define it <laughs> um, it's actually it's a concept from chaos magic where Ooh. what you make is you're you're basically making a thought form that carries out a task and for me the thought form was this and see this bird that uh sole job was to whenever i had these thoughts i could call on it and say can you or envision it swooping in and eating these um intrusive thoughts as if they were like gnats or flies or um stuff buzzing yeah. around my head and uh i would you know once a month i would meditate and give it intention and instructions as just to kind of um strengthen it and i had it for years for at least two three years and i will say you know therapy medication and this servitor all have helped me so that i don't have uh so that one i don't have as many intrusive thoughts as i used to but also now i'm to the point where when i do have self self-doubt and the like i can say to myself you know this is not this self-doubt is coming from the outside it is not coming from the inside it is you know this is how i view other people viewing me and i'm putting onto them uh what i think they're thinking of me and frankly i can't control what other people think about me so um why bother why put that energy into that and give it attention holy crap that's 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 an epiphany <laughs> Okay, I have two questions okay. more about the servitor. One, did you name it? I'm not asking for the name, but one, did you name it? And two, why did you choose a bird? Did you choose a bird or did that just happen? Okay. Well, I already said the name and I, I'm comfortable saying the name now because uh, I, it's no longer, uh, I no longer have it. Uh, I named it Nevermore and oh, yeah. it came out, it just came to me looking like, um, kind of like a raven. Um but with a mouth that opened up really wide uh, because, you know, some of that, some of that jerk brain thoughts were huge. Uh, that it did needed. it have teeth? Uh, it did not. Um, it was, but it was a large raven. And that's just what came to me when I was uh, first saying, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give this a try. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
now I'm now that's what I'm thinking. Oh, am I going to do this? What's mine going to be? <laughs> I honestly, I I totally think that uh, again, people should. Yes, you should uh, see a doctor. You should see therapy. You get therapy. You get your medication and everything like that. But um, there is a you know magical aspect to a lot of the stuff we're dealing with, and uh, why not? give it a try, a try to have a magical solution to that, to, uh, complement and to support the, um, medication side and the therapy side. I was very lucky in that I had a therapist who, um, was open and very, uh, accepting about that. I was like, like at one point we were going through a survey and she's like, okay, so do you have, uh, do you engage in magical thinking? And I'm like, well, I'm a witch. <laughs> And she kind of laughed. She's like, okay, let's, you know. Um, so it for people who are looking into therapy, uh, you may have to go through a few therapists since you find one. Again, you will find therapists who are totally fine with, uh, if you're Christian, saying, okay, well, you're praying to God about this and uh, here's some Bible verses or whatever. But the minute you start talking about crystals and... Uh, <laughs> tarot cards and stuff then they get a little weird about that uh so it may take some time to find a therapist who is accepting of that but i was very lucky and uh she was like nope you do what you gotta do to help you get better and i and she's like as long as you're taking your medication and we're having therapy too go for it use everything in your toolbox exactly therapy medication Magic. It's all in your toolbox. And also keep trying until you find the right therapist because my most, my current therapist is the second one I've had since I've moved here to Tucson. My first one, I really think she might have been a witch. <laughs> <laughs> because we, she, I didn't have to explain things to her that normally I would have to explain. <laughs> With the, my current one, I don't, I'm pretty sure she's not Christian, but she's not a witch, but she is accepting of the things and she will, well, yeah, like the magical thinking thing. Mm -hmm. People with obsessive compulsive disorder, we all know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, find a therapy, find a therapist, people. Find, look until you find somebody who is okay with you being a witch. And it's, it's okay to, if you have a therapist to stop working out it's okay to say that's no and find move on um i ended up having to walk out of a therapy session with a therapist once and uh and it's okay nothing you know you're not you're not gonna get a black mark on your name you're not gonna get detention or anything you're not like in that. trouble yeah you're not in trouble for saying nope you know what this isn't working out I will admit, when you said that, I it was immediately terrified. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I don't know that I could do that, but I could not come back after. Yeah, I would go to that therapist. <laughs> I feel like oftentimes by sharing uh, these kind of uh, sharing these experiences, uh, they tend to either give people a script where they're like, oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to follow the script. Or it gives them permission. Absolutely. Uh, and I, you know, so if you're listening now and you're in a therapy with a therapist that doesn't work out, I give you permission to find a different therapist if that's what's been holding you back. Not that I'm any kind of like authority or believe that I, you know, am really in, even in any position to give permission. But I also know that sometimes for some people that is, uh, something that makes it easier for them yeah me too i'm not in charge of anything either <laughs> i'm barely in charge of myself exactly <laughs> me too <laughs> what would you say is your biggest struggle when it comes to your practice um finding time uh like i am a mother i have two children um I have a house to keep uh, going. I just finished, like, I'm writing, so I just finished edits, which uh, sucked up every single piece of brain power that I had. Um, 
getting the edits done. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, having all that, it's not so much finding the time, but uh, finding the motivation that it's very easy to be like, you know, I I could find a way to make this also, to include my magic in this also, but I just don't have it in me to think something up, uh, which is why I feel like um, once I figure something out that uh, putting it in my toolbox, like, uh, it helps because I already know like I'm gonna, I need to mop the floors. Well, I'm going to include some moon water in my uh, my mop bucket because then while I'm mopping, I can also um, ha set the intention of protection and purification and cleansing. Um, I think that oftentimes we feel like we have to come up with something new every time we do magic, and it has to always be novel, and uh, I think that that leads to kind of burnout and feeling like, well, since I can't think of anything, I just won't do it. And I know that for me, that often is the case where I'm just like, I am kind of tired and uh, just don't have it in me. Um, Whereas if it's something that I've already done before, magically, I can fall back on that and be like, no, it's totally okay to do this thing that I've done a million times before. And also that's part of the magic is, you know, building up that, um, I don't want to call it residue, but that, that those layers of the half-life. Yes. Like medication. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uranium, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you the most joy in your practice? Oh, um, when I am in the middle of, even if it's just a, a really simple little thing like lighting a candle, um, there's this sense of connection that I have with, uh, something bigger than me. I mean, that was one of the reasons why for the longest time I kept uh, going to church, even when I was older and, you know, you get to the teenage years and that's usually when uh, you kind of stop going. Um, I didn't need to go anymore because uh, my parents were like, get out of the house. Uh, in fact, they started to get really annoyed the fact that I was going to church. Uh, part of it was I was going with my grandmother, but part of it was that sense of connection to something larger um, that I just feel like uh, a puzzle piece that's fit into the place that I'm supposed to go. And I like that sense of connectedness and that sense of peace that comes with it. That sounds so nice. <laughs> I think I've experienced that, but only fleetingly. I need to do more work. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> I, you know, it, once you start uh, feeling it and when you take the time to make a note of when you have felt it, it makes it a lot easier to go back to that again and to recreate those situations where you have that feeling. Um, I often feel like witches are very much like scientists or should be like scientists in the idea of, uh, what is it that, uh, Jamie from Mythbuster says the difference between screwing around in science is writing it down. Um, hmm. I, I feel like with witches, uh, that's one of the things where a book of shadows is so super, important and valuable where you can sit down and you can write down, okay, I did this ritual. This is how it made me feel. Or these are the times that I have felt that connection or I've done this thing or that thing and it's worked because then you can go back and look at it and be like, oh, okay, yeah. I feel more connected when I'm standing in my shower visualizing that the water coming down is cleansing me or when I am out in the garden and I'm uh, planting something, then I feel that connectedness. And then you can build off of that to start uh, expanding so that you feel it more often. 
Noted. <laughs> I'm going to have to do that. I'm so hesitant to write things down. Well, uh, mainly because of laziness, <laughs> to be honest. It does take some some uh, some work. Uh, most of my my I'll admit that all of my book of shadows are not actual book of shadows. They are my planners, my yearly planners, where I will write down uh, on the days uh, when I've done stuff. I don't do to do lists. I do done lists. So I'll hmm. write down what I've done. And then that way I can go back over uh, and be like, oh, on this day I did this. Or, uh, I mean, a lot of it is just, you know, groceries and uh, clean the house and that. But also anything that I do that is in any way significant or magical, I'll note that as well. Because then I can always take some time to go back over it. I need to be more like that. <laughs> Or I need to find the equivalent that I am able to do. Yeah, look, Book of Shadows, I think that we tend to uh, have this idea that they need to be this really pretty, leather-bound, uh, beautiful books that we write beautiful calligraphy in and do beautiful <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> <You're not lying. laughs> um, but honestly, they can be anything. Like, I know a lot of people, and for a while there, uh, I have a, I had a separate Book of Shadows that was a Pinterest board. Ooh. Um, you can do things like scrapbooking or, um, even just writing notes on your phone. I mean, it doesn't have to be this very, um, beautifully detailed thing. It, you just have to do the work. So whatever makes it easier for you to do the work, and if it works for you, then who cares what other people might think of your uh, sticky note book of shadows that is all over no, your your desk? <laughs> <laughs> Mine actually is a very pretty leather bound thing, but inside there's a bunch of Sharpie scrawl. And, and I only write things down if I am trying to reproduce it late, planning on reproducing it later. Otherwise, everything is spur of the moment, then it goes away. <laughs> That's that's also how I cook, and it's equally frustrating in both places <laughs> later. <laughs> what is your biggest fear in witchcraft? It used to be screwing stuff up. And I think a lot of people, when they first come to witchcraft, they feel like they have to have it absolutely perfect. Um, now my biggest fear is... Um, honestly, my biggest fear right now is that I'll write something and that it'll be wrong or awful. And then people will screw things cancel up. You. <laughs> no, I not canceling. Oh. I don't care. Oh. Like I don't read the reviews or anything like that because even if they're good reviews, <gasps> good for you. Um, I know that I will take it to heart. So that I don't care about. It's mostly, I feel like it's, I have a responsibility to provide the most accurate information that I can and oftentimes I just worry that I'm going to give somebody some information that is wrong and then they screw something up. It's one of the reasons why I love and also hate doing the edits because then my editors come back and they're like, okay, so here's all the places where stuff wasn't clear or um, like most recently I have a thing in this third book about using stones as infusers for essential oils to um, on your altar. And my editors came back with, oh my God, if you have cats, don't do this because it could severely harm or kill your cats. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh no, I I like just felt awful for a while thinking, oh my God, if I don't, uh, and wondering if I should even keep it in the book or if I should, you know, we ended up putting big warnings saying, if you have cats, you know, don't do this because- uh, Or birds. Uh, I think I put cats and then pets. So yeah, birds <laughs> would, uh, but- uh, in my first book, I had a bit about using, uh, taking your leftover bits of string 
and putting them out for birds to use in their nest. And then later learned that that's a no-no too, because uh, it can, the longer pieces can tangle up birds' uh, feet or their wings and it could lead to death. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So uh, we have to put a, a warning in subsequent editions about, th uh, about that. Although I think they're, they might be just taking that out of the book for subsequent editions. Um, so that's my big worry in witchcraft is that I'm going to give people information that uh, is not thoroughly vetted, um, which is why I love my editors so much because <laughs> they, they catch that. And then it's interesting that you have to have a witchy editor to that's interesting that other writers would not have to worry about. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, in some ways they would, but specifically, <laughs> Well, yeah, specifically. That's interesting. I mean, well, and as witches, we use a lot of, I mean, think of like uh, flying ointment or some of the other ingredients we will use where you have to have things saying, okay, yeah, you can use this herb in your practice, just don't eat it or you will die. You know, having things like that, making sure that, you know, we let people know, label your jars, people. Oh my gosh. Because otherwise, if you don't label stuff, then you end up not knowing what stuff is. Yeah, it's witchcraft is, it is serious business. And I think people tend to forget that because, again, they focus on this whole idea of woo-ness and, um, oh, you're just, you know, dancing around naked underneath the moon. Well, even then, you got to make sure that you're, where you're dancing around naked, that you're not going to get hypothermia, so... Serious business, people. <laughs> what is something you did early in your practice that you no longer do, and why um, don't you do it anymore? Big rituals. Like, again, when I first started off, uh, I... You know, I, I came into the practice via um, Cunningham, which I think a lot of people my age did because back in the 90s, that was kind of living Wicca and solitary Wicca. And, and that was uh, on every bookshelf uh, everywhere. And there was a big emphasis early on on doing these big rituals and these big uh, productions. And I don't do them anymore, mostly because I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> but also because that's just not how I prefer to spellcast and practice. Um, I know that for some people, they like the theater of that. And that's totally cool. If it works for you, then, you know, absolutely get all out, you know, get break out the ceremonial robes and the jewelry and uh, call the quarters and all of that. But for me, it's... Um, it just never led to that feeling of connection that I get with just from lighting a candle. Yeah. All that sounds exhausting to me. <laughs> I don't think I have the attention span for it. <laughs> I'm being absolutely serious. Oh, I, I, I totally I, get I, it. I, there was a, a ritual that I didn't go to because I was physically unable at that point to go to it, but. I, I think I still might, I might have gone just to see what it was like, but I think I would have gotten bored and distracted, which is not appropriate. So I'm, I just don't know if I'll go this next year, even if I can, <laughs> because I don't want to be the one who's distracting everyone else because I'm being myself. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite tool in your practice? It doesn't have to be an actual physical object. Um, right now, my favorite tool is my brain. Uh, and I say that, I, I, I said that out loud and it sounds like really uh, snarky and pretentious, but um, I do a lot of work on the astral right now. Uh, I have in, I have a little idealized cottage that I go to that is uh, basically, if you imagine a, a cottage in a forest, that's what you're going to see. And um, I have done a lot of, it's a place where I go where I do a lot of my, um, my spell casting, where I meet with a lot of the um, spirit helpers that I work with. And uh, I like it because 
it's not limited to what I have physically. After having two major moves in four years, I don't have a lot of physical tools. <laughs> Our last move, we had to stuff everything into this tiny little trailer, so a lot of stuff got left behind. Uh, but on the Astral, I can have the big, beautiful cauldron and all the herbs hanging from the uh, the rafters and all of my tools around me to then do my uh, spell casting. That sounds so nice. If you could only recommend one book to a new witch, what would it be and why? Oh, um, that's a really good question. You know what? I'm going to go with, this is really old school, but I'm going to go with Urban Pagan by Telesco. Hmm. Because uh, that was one of the first ones that I read after Cunningham. And it has a lot of really great, it's a, a very broad, it covers a broad range of topics. Um, most of the witches I, people that are going to be coming to witchcraft just, uh, by number wise are going to be living in urban spaces. Um, and because it's a more modern take, you don't get caught up on, uh, because again, I love the cottage, cottage aesthetic and the, uh, hedge witch aesthetic of witchcraft, but also I know that a lot of people aren't going to have access to uh wild places or to that kind of uh area so having a uh, book that is specifically for how you practice and be a pagan it also has spell casting and, and stuff in it how you do that as um while living in a city or living in a suburb i think would be super useful i'll have to look that up it is a it it is an old book. It's like from the nineties again with um you know I think we tend to uh get um caught up on, on the books that we originally grew up with or, or came into the practice with and I think it stands up better to the test of time than some of the other books that came out around then. You say you've moved around quite a bit. Would you say that environment has shaped your practice? And if you, has it changed based on where you lived? Oh, yeah. Um, so I grew up in Wyoming and I'm back in Wyoming now. Um, and in between that, I ended up uh, living in Illinois, uh, right outside of Chicago for 20 some odd years. And um, yeah, uh, growing up, uh, as a young little witch, not witch, um, you know, I learned about herbs and I learned about how, um, not how to use them magically, but I learned uh, specifically medicinal properties of various herbs and plants. And I would, you know, wander the alleyways and the neighborhood and collect sticks and um, uh nightshade and uh dandelions and marigolds and all of that um and growing up in wyoming one of the big uh plants out here is sagebrush so that's uh what i grew up with as an aromatic um and then living in illinois it's a completely different environment and different um different plants uh so i ended up that's when I ended up in Illinois when I was learning, uh, really getting into witchcraft and still, and my beginning my path and learning all the plants there, um, going to parks. Uh, I didn't really have access to, uh, forests or, um, any kind of wild land. So I would, was kind of limited to what I could pick up from. I did a lot of, uh, haunting, uh, witchy stores and occult shops for um, tools and for ingredients. Um, and now that I'm back out here in Wyoming, I can do more foraging. I'm like 15 minutes away from the mountains. Um, and I'm getting back into learning not only the local fauna and uh, flora, but learning uh, where I can go to forage and, and, and 
working with the land here, getting uh, reacquainted with it. And I do believe that um, it may not affect your practice so much, the, the environment that you're in, um, but it will affect your relationships with whatever spirits are in the area, in the area, whatever um, genus loci are around um, what you have, what is available to you tool wise and ingredient wise. Um, like right now I'm living in a college town. So there's two witchy shops that I can go to if I needed like uh, crystals or um, herbs or, or what have you. But in other, you know, the town that I grew up in, uh, the closest bookstore was two hours away. So <laughs> you didn't really, you had to make do with what you could find as opposed to going out and buying something. Hmm. How do you pull yourself out of a magical slump? Oh, um, I hear people ask that all the time. Oh, I just feel like I don't have any magic left anymore. And, I don't know how to get it back. Um, that's, yeah, that's tough. That's, um, for me, it tends to fall into two categories. Either I uh, go back to what I know. So start simply just like, okay, just light a candle. Just uh, light some incense. Um, take a moment, talk to your, talk to my spirit helpers. Um, the other part of it is if I don't even have the energy for that is to just start, uh, talking big to myself. And, uh, when my brain says, oh, you know, I'm just not feeling it. Just be like, but you are a magic sparkle witch bitch. Uh, of course you have magic in you. It's just hiding and you need to, you know, pull on your, you know, witch up and go and do this thing. Um, and sometimes that works. Sometimes just talking big to myself, like as if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> sometimes I can trick myself. Uh, <laughs> I relate. <laughs> Do you ever work with other witches? Um, I have not, although I do love talking with other witches. I love, um, sharing ideas and uh discussing um it i i like it as a kind of uh a support system i feel like having some people either witches or at least people who understand that you're witchy uh that you can talk to um either bouncing ideas off of or you know saying oh i did this thing um but i've Mostly, I've never really worked with other witches, mostly just because I haven't um, been in a place where uh, the witches I know where we're physically uh, in the same spot. Um, most of my witch friends are people that I've either never met, and we just know each other from the internet, or um, we ended up moving away from each other. <laughs> so it's mostly just a whole lot of chatting uh, about stuff not really working together. Not that I'm opposed to it or anything like that. It's just I've never had really the, um, the opportunity. Who or what would you say are the three biggest influences on your practice? Oh, okay. Um, so this is going to be a little bit weird. Uh, the first one is Terry Pratchett, uh, which if you aren't familiar with him, he is, he was a, uh, English author of fantasy and science fiction, uh, most notable for his, uh, Discworld novels. And he had in there, um, witches, uh, the most, the one that most people, if they know about him, is uh, Granny Weatherwax. And he wrote a lot about how magic works that makes sense to me uh, and wrote about witches in a way that I'm like, no, this is, I, I can see, I know 
real world witches that are like this. Um, so it's it may seem kind of weird that it's a fantasy author that's my first number one, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and then my next uh, one would be again Telesco, um, just because uh, again she was one of like I came in with Cunningham. Uh, Telesco was the one who just um, really made sense to me. Like, I started off with Wicca, and Wicca didn't make sense to me. Or it, it felt, I, I'm like, I just came from a religion of worship. I'm not really interested in another worship religion. Um, so Telesco was my... Uh, the one who taught me a lot of my early about a lot of my early practice, the stuff that I took to heart. And then um, the other one, I guess I'd have to say Markle, who is Jean Markle, who is a French author, um, did a book. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find it on my. Yeah, uh, wrote a book called The Great Goddess, which is uh, a look at, um, you know, Paleolithic and prehistoric and then uh, later on uh, goddess worship, which again, it, it seems weird because I'm talking about how I'm not interested in worship, but then here's this author who's writing about uh, the goddess um and all of this just kind of these authors and their ideas kind of coalesced into what my practice was and what it continues to evolve towards. What would, what advice do you have for witches who are just getting started? Like they have, they don't even, they might've bought a book and a candle. Okay. Um, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, because this witchcraft, because magic is so large and there's so many different ways to practice it, uh, you're going to have a lot of people who say, this is the way you do witchcraft and any other way is, uh, bogus. Or you're going to have a lot of people who are going to say, this is how you do this. And, um, I don't think anybody ever gets into witchcraft to follow in lockstep with somebody else's ideas. I think that you get into witchcraft and you practice witchcraft because there is an individual part of you that is looking for a magical expression. So reading, uh, you know, looking, getting information, watching YouTube videos, watching tic TikTok, uh, going onto Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, finding Discord servers, reading blog posts and books and stuff, that is all fantastic ways to get information, but you should always uh, always perceive that information and uh, filter it through your own moral compass and your own uh, goals as a witch so that you can build a truly um, individual practice. Because when it's individual and when it's uh, personalized, I feel like the magic is more effective. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good answer. <laughs> who do you think I should have on the show? Who would you like to hear answering these questions? Oh, um, okay. Understanding that I don't know who you've already had on the show, so I may say people that you already have, and if so, then let me know because then I can go back and listen. Um, but, um, Matt Aaron, uh, uh, goals, goals, goals. I want, I want him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think that he is just awesome and, uh, his books are great. Um, I've been afraid to ask. <laughs> oh no, you should just totally ask. Uh, like, let's, that's how I, I reached out to you. I was afraid to ask people to see if they wanted me on their podcasts. And then, uh, I was just like, I'll just. I'll just message people. Worst thing that'll happen is they'll say no. Exactly. Uh, 
and but still i'm yeah. still afraid <laughs> um laura uh tempest zakroff is amazing yes there's also uh let me i gotta pull out her book um jenny blonde who has a book that just came out called hearth and home witchcraft um she's known as the comfy cozy witch oh yeah uh she's pretty awesome too um, and then the last one, uh, Naja Lightfoot of uh, Good Juju. She's fantastic as well. Cool. I'm telling you all the I will, authors. I will that... look them up. I'm going to look. <laughs> I'm telling you all the, all the authors and witches that are on my, when you ask me uh, who, if there's any that I envy. There you go. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's all the cool people that I wish that I was, all the cool witches that I wish I was friends with. You should go interview them. <laughs> Is there anything you will else? Is there anything that you wanted to talk about or that I didn't ask or anything you wanted to ask me? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I have um, I have my two books that have already uh, come out. They're both by Llewellyn or from Llewellyn. You can get them on Amazon or from your uh, local bookstore. Um, my third book that's coming out, that'll be out uh, fall of 2023. Um, right now, I also have a Patreon that, um, where I post uh, not only sneak peeks of what I'm writing on, but I post about um, ways to include magic in your, in your life, in your mundane life. Um, also, we're going to be starting up a Discord so that we can chat. Uh, and that's really a lot that I'm working on. It is. Um, and then the other thing I'm doing is I'm doing a project with my husband that is a tabletop uh, role-playing game of magic and witchcraft. <gasps> what? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. It's called Coven and Crucible. Oh my gosh. Uh, I, that sounds cool. It, it is very cool. We've been working on it for the last year. We're going to be doing a Kickstarter of it uh, cool. soon. And it is, um, I, I, I describe it as John Wick meets the last witch hunter. Holy jeez. It was so a bunch of killing and there better not be any dead bodies. No, 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 no. Uh, I can't. Frankly, That's why I never watched another one of those movies. Yeah, no. Frankly, uh, we've been doing a play test for the past year, and most of it is a whole lot of um, thirsty witches, actually, mm. and 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 uh, people posting the outfits that they're wearing while they're doing cool <laughs> magic stuff. So it's it's really fun. It's hilarious uh, watching people take something that you wrote and turn it into a role playing game. That is cool. Yeah, it's it's it is uh I've always wanted to do something where I could work with my husband and we've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh when I first approached him I about it, I I said, "Hey, you so do you want to take your, our relationship to the next level?" and he immediately <laughs> said, "Yes." And I'm like, "I'd like to I'd like to wow. uh how about we write a role-playing game?" And he's like, "That's even better." <laughs> oh. Well, I wonder what he thought you meant. <laughs> Okay, at the end, I ask two things of my guest. Oh. That they, they, that they don't know what's going to happen. Uh-oh. <laughs> First, recommend something to the listeners. Anything. It doesn't have to be which at all. Just anything. Oh. Whatever you're into right now, recommend it. Oh, okay. So right now, I'm into this uh, Canadian series that came out a few years ago. It's called uh, Killjoys. Uh, it's a science fiction show. My husband ooh, uh, introduced ooh. me to it. It is amazing and hilarious. Um, what platform? Um, right now, we're using... Uh, you can get it on Vudu. Either you can buy the series or I think uh, Freebie is the other place where you can watch it. Maybe? Uh, but you can absolutely get it on Vudu. It's a... Um, it's just an amazing Canadian science fiction show that's hilarious. Cool. The second thing. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I'm I've doing heard, this to I've, you. I've, I don't know why I point. chose you to terrify. <laughs> I'm ready. It's not a big deal. Would you please tell me a story that you love to tell? 
Okay. Yes, I will absolutely. I will tell you the story of how, uh, of my daughter's birth, because Ooh. it is hilarious and awesome. Um. So, I my daughter, she's eighteen year old, years old now. Uh, first, my first child. I have two of them. Um, and I woke up one morning and I'm like, I'm having contractions. And I knew I was having contractions, but I also knew that uh, a lot of hospitals don't, um, especially when you're a first-time mother, they'll be like, oh, they could be Braxton Hicks. I didn't want to go to the hospital and get sent back. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. So in my brain, and I'm like, no, I'm totally experiencing contractions. This is a thing. And in my brain, I'm like, you know what? If my water breaks, then they have to bring let me into the hospital i don't know why this was like where my brain went to but i'm like okay so what what gets your water to break and i'm like oh i you know heavy lifting so i'm like i'm gonna fill up the dog dually before we need to leave which is the little septic tank thing that uh for your dogs and so i filled up this five gallon bucket full of water and i'm like uh just waddling over to it, lifting this thing. I'm, you know, nine months pregnant, in between in labor, in labor. But I'm like, I'm gonna do this, and 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 all of a sudden, I feel this rush of warm liquid. I'm like, hot damn, yes! I totally, my water is broken. We're gonna go to the hospital now. They're gonna be like, all right, and deliver my child. Uh, so I waddle back into the house, and all of a sudden, this little voice in the back of my head goes did your water really break or did you just piss yourself? I'm like, holy shit, I don't know. And so I'm like, wait a second. I read that, because I had read everything. Like, this is my first kid. And and so I read Mm -hmm. first pregnancy, read everything. I'm like, I've read that amniotic fluid smells sweet. Oh, no. (laughs) And so... And so I I get into the bedroom and I pull off these sweatpants that I've lived in for several months, which is the other reason I wanted to, like, give birth because I was tired of living in sweatpants. And my ex walks in on me sniffing the crotch (laughs) of my pants. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm trying to tell if this smells like sweet or like pee. What do you think? And he's just like, I'm not going to sniff those. Um. (laughs) Eventually went to the doctor, or went to the hospital because I finally told the doctor, I'm like, because we had called him. And he's like, well, tell me when you can't um, talk through con- the contractions. And I'm like, my my dear sir, um, I I come from a family of talkers. There is not, <laughs> nothing short of death will keep us from talking. But I finally, t- I told him, look, I was trying to write a note to my neighbor to f- watch the dogs and I couldn't think of the word through the contraction and he's like fine just come to the hospital so i get to the hospital and they're like nope your your uh your water hasn't broken so i'm like great i just i i just pissed myself on the day of my daughter's birth this is awesome and i love telling that story to my daughter whenever uh i get the chance because you know now she's gotten over the embarrassment of it and just kind of rolls her eyes but yeah um it's, Wait, it's so that wasn't it? No. I I I ended up giving birth to her um several hours later, but yeah, I had I had pissed myself instead of uh oh, because my of water. The, wow. Just That's I was some just, good contracting. Yeah. <laughs> that and carrying, you know, a full five gallon bucket full of water waddling across the backyard oh. trying to <laughs> But at least it was really labor. Yes, this is true. Uh, I was just terrified that we were going to show up at the hospital and they'd say, nope, you're not in labor and send me back. And, you know, because hospitals are did notorious they or did for did they not... hold you? Huh? Did they do that? Or did they just say you, it didn't break, but you really are in labor? Yeah, they said you really are in labor. It, your water didn't break. Um, in fact, it broke when they were examining me. So okay, uh, they didn't send you home. <laughs> no, they did not send me home because by then I was like, I was like, please don't send me home. I just want to, uh, just give me a baby. <laughs> yeah, can can we just push this push this baby? I'm done. Uh, she's she's fully cooked. Let's just uh, get her out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> 
Man. Yeah, I would I would I would love for my mom to just tell random people the story. <laughs> Yeah, she's had she's had eighteen years to get used to uh, just ridiculous stuff. Well, I mean, it doesn't reflect on her at all. No, not at all. It's not like the time that she started singing uh, when she was like three years old and started singing "Fire, Water, Burn" uh, in front of her grandmother. When I learned that she will pick up lyrics really, really quickly. Oh. And then had to start. All of those kids learning so fast. Yeah, that's when I was like, okay, I gotta stop, you know, gotta, gotta adjust my car listening. Well, thank you for being on the show and thank telling you. stories. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. I agree. This has been fun. All right, then I will see you on the internet then. Okay. Bye. Bye. If you'd like a free autographed copy of Rachel's book, The Scent of Lemon and Rosemary, be sure to check out the giveaway on Instagram. Look at the caption under the graphic shown in the episode artwork for instructions to enter. And now, Rachel. Yes. Welcome to Patreon. Hello, Patreon. That said, what do you dislike about the witch community? <laughs> uh, um, Leading up to that one. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like uh, it's getting better, but um, it's very... It's to hear more of the Patreon episode, head over to patreon.com slash Curios for a free seven-day trial. Get podcast bonuses, videos, recipes access to the Marco Polo group, and more. There are also tiers where you can get a monthly spell box, intentional handcrafted jewelry that I make especially for witches, and even a special crystal box. Check it out at patreon.com slash Curios. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast, Twitter at Average Witch Pod, Facebook at facebook.com slash your average witch podcast at your average witch.com and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review. You can review us on Amazon and Apple podcasts, and now you can rate us on Spotify. You just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. To rate your average witch on Spotify, click the home key, click on your average witch podcast, and then leave a rating. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com slash Curios. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to youraveragewitchpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the moon changes. <laughs>